Hi, my name is Sherry Rendell, and I am Ferris Director of State and Local Engagement, and I am joined by Zoom with Susan Tully. She is the Manager of Law Enforcement Relations and Special Projects, and I want to thank you for joining Ferris Podcast today. We have a special guest with us, Sheriff Steve Reams of Weld County. He has been uh, with the Weld County Sheriff's Office since 1997. He is serving his third term and his last term as sheriff, and he provides public safety for over 300,000 Weld County residents and oversees more than 450 employees. So thank you very much for your time. Sheriff, I have heard that you recently lost one of your deputies to illegal alien crime. And first, I want to say I'm really sorry for your loss. Will you please share with our audience a little bit about uh, Deputy Alexis, who was killed, and what happened, as well as at what point you knew that the crime was perpetrated by an illegal alien? Sure. Uh, again, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, the story is pretty tragic uh, in that uh, Deputy Alexis Hein Newts. Um, she had been a deputy with us for several years. Um, she was 25 years old and she worked in our detentions division. She was actually uh, riding her motorcycle to work uh, on the day that she was killed. Um, she was killed less than a mile from my office. Uh, but while she was riding her motorcycle to work, um, another driver on a side road pulled out in front of her uh, from a stop sign where she had the right of way. Uh, she hit him going about 50 miles an hour and was killed instantly uh, when she struck his van. Uh, the driver of the van um, immediately fled the scene on foot, ran into a cornfield uh, like a coward and uh, evaded capture. He was able to get picked up by, um, a, unknown, uh, by a farmer that was driving down the road, just thought he was someone that needed help. Uh, fled the scene before law enforcement even, even got there from what we can tell, uh, but shortly Shortly after discovering the scene and realizing that it was a deputy that had been killed, um, we also found uh, paperwork inside the van that led us to the, uh, the name of the, the suspect. And it was pretty obvious that uh, the, the documents that were found inside the van had been forged documents, a green card and some other paperwork. Um, it, like I said, it was pretty obvious that uh, based on the suspect's actions and the documents we found that um, he was likely an illegal immigrant and uh, on top of that we also found indications that he'd been drinking um, while he was driving so you know just compounded the, the issue um, not to focus too much on the suspect but um, uh, the fact that he fled the scene was another telltale sign that um, you know he, he probably wasn't uh, right with the law if you will and uh, it took us about three days in a manhunt to finally track him down and obviously when we found him, um, it was confirmed that he was in the country illegally and it actually changed his name. The documents that we discovered inside of the vehicle he was driving were in fact forged. Um, <laughs> so long and short of it, he's, he's sitting in jail now, but uh, his history was one that uh, this was not the first time he had, he had committed an act like this. About nine years prior to this incident, he had also fled the scene of an accident. Luckily, no one was killed that time. Uh, he was sentenced to, to my jail, the Weld County Jail, and never reported for that sentence and instead just changed his name and then nine years later uh, killed my deputy. Wow. Sheriff, I have to ask you because that leads me to the question that in 2019, Colorado became a sanctuary state. Yes. Meaning, you know, anybody in the hands of law enforcement, you could not uh, work with ICE from that point on. How do you feel that uh, these changes in that law uh, have changed possibly the outcome of what might have happened with this particular person? Well, with this particular person, obviously, uh, he never even reported to jail on his first offense um, when he was ordered to do so by the courts. But um, the, the change in the law in Colorado in 2019, uh, it, it's, been, it's been bad for the state of Colorado. It's been bad for... Uh, for the legal residents of the state of Colorado because it's invited uh, lawlessness from uh, from folks who are here illegally who want to continue to perform illegal acts. It's not to say that everyone that's in the state illegally is is still committing criminal acts, 
But obviously, if they choose to do so, holding those folks accountable is uh, exponentially harder than it than it should be, uh, only because uh, law enforcement in Colorado can't have any kind of meaningful uh, interaction or relationship with ICE officials. Right. So you you feel the impact of the sanctuary law that went into effect. I don't think there's any corner of this state that hasn't felt the impact. Um, we routinely hear stories about hit and run accidents. In fact, Denver leads the leads the state and leads many parts parts of the nation uh, in hit and run accidents. And oftentimes, uh, those drivers that that flee the scene are are suspected illegals. All right, thank you, Sheriff. Um, it seems like Colorado has been uh, competing with California to give the most public benefits to illegal aliens. With our open borders, have you seen Colorado being a magnet for more illegal immigration, especially uh, since the Biden administration? Uh, I think the quick answer to that is yes. Um, you know, over the last 10 years, uh, we've seen ebbs and flows, but uh, the last two, we've definitely seen a, an impact of illegal immigration uh, on the state of Colorado. And where that's most manifested is through uh, drug, uh, legal drug distribution. We have a fentanyl crisis in the state of Colorado. Um, you know, we've we've long been pretty permissive in this state uh, when it comes to narcotics use, but um, the flow of illegal narcotics into the state that are obviously coming across the uh, the, the Mexican border. I mean, it's it's felt each and every day. We have uh, more fentanyl introduced into my jail um, than I, I can even. It, it's hard to even describe how how much of a challenge it is. Well, that was kind of what my next question was. That you have fentanyl. We have fentanyl coming through the southern border, and to you, it would be coming then through California or Arizona to get to you, because all fentanyl has to have come from Mexico with precursors coming from China. And so these people who are bringing those drugs in have the opportunity to the human traffickers who brought them to pay off their debts by distributing drugs and bringing the fentanyl. So um, we have seen the CDC says that in Colorado alone, from August of 2021 to August of 2022, you have had in the state 973 fentanyl deaths. How can you, do you have any statistics specific to Weld County? Uh, you know, what's happening in your community? Well, as far as fentanyl overdose deaths, I don't keep a running tally of that. That's, that's more of a corner statistic. But I can tell you that um, we're using more Narcan than we ever have um, at any in any point in our history. Uh, it's routine for my deputies, not just on the patrol side of the house, but also in my detentions division, to have to administer uh, Narcan on on suspects or or inmates inside of uh, inside of our facility, and that's a very scary topic because fentanyl is so easily secreted, especially when it's in pill form that uh, upon arrest will oftentimes get uh, individuals that will secrete um, fentanyl inside of their body and then obviously try to use it once they get them to the jail. Uh, but there's there's not a jurisdiction in, in Weld County and it's a 4,000 square mile county. Uh, we we routinely run into fentanyl and you hear it being administered, you hear Narcan being administered almost every day. Um, and oftentimes these people are on their third or fourth time of, of being in contact with law enforcement um, for these types of incidents. Thank you. Colorado has legalized marijuana, and we've heard from other sheriffs in your state that cartels are growing within these legal grows. How does that impact the public safety, and what are you seeing? Sure. Uh, we've Colorado's kind of been on the front edge of this, and uh, it's a dubious distinction because we actually legalized uh, some forms of marijuana as far back as 2000. So this has been an issue that's grown uh, quite a bit over the last 20 years. Uh, but to the current state, marijuana is, um, it's its obviously a gateway drug for a lot of folks, but it's, it's an industry that invites other illegal narcotics. Uh, as we've as most people know, it's a, it's a lot eagle, a lot easier to smuggle illegal fentanyl across the border than it is to to smuggle uh, illegal marijuana. Well, there's no need to smuggle marijuana anymore. So, uh, the cartels have figured out that they can distribute drugs from Colorado 
uh, much easier than they can uh, from their own from their own country. So the way that that manifests itself is you 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 get hubs or pockets that are uh, formed in in outlying areas of Colorado. Um, my agency specifically has worked a kidnapping case where we raided a well we raided three different houses trying to locate our kidnapping suspect and found 16 illegals uh, amongst these three homes. All of them had been illegally trafficked into the United States. And because of the laws of Colorado, we couldn't even turn that case over to ICE officials so that they could pick it up and try to work it from that point. So you had a legal narcotics distribution, you had a kidnapping case, uh, there a, a bunch of different, very dangerous, um, I guess, components there and very little that law enforcement could do. And that's just one anecdotal story of, of hundreds that could be told in this state. So, so in keeping with that, when, when Colorado legalized the sale of marijuana, do you feel like it invited then the cartels to come in and compete for growing marijuana with the people who have the legal licenses to do so? Um, has that really created this hostile environment between the legal growers and Mexican cartels as well? Uh, I don't know that there's a hostile environment. There's just an environment where it's it's very difficult to know what's illegal grow and what's not. So they can basically hide in the wide open. Again, regu- there, there's no real uh, hammer. There's no real regulatory uh, emphasis on the state of Colorado. So knowing what's illegal grow, what's a cartel grow, what's a, a, a quote unquote legitimate grow, uh, it's almost impossible. So just the enforcement of of any kind of effective marijuana restrictions in the state of Colorado have almost gone away. Uh, so it's it's an it's open season for the cartels to operate here if they choose to. So for all those states who are considering uh, legally selling marijuana, what you're saying to me now is there's no way of knowing what what marijuana is produced legally and illegally, and all of those supposed protections that everybody was going to have are non-existent. Is that correct? That's, I, I would affirm that, yes, it's at least the way the state of Colorado is set up. And until there's a national network that uh, that, that makes it standardized across the country, uh, you're gonna continue to have these problems. Um, and, and I will add to this, any tax revenue that the state of Colorado uh, receives from uh, the marijuana industry, uh, we <laughs> we pay out far more in uh, in problems that legalizing marijuana has caused for the state. It's good to know. Thank you. Sheriff, what would you uh, say with the human smuggling and trafficking you have seen recently, and how has that changed over the years since you've been a sheriff? Well, I've been with the sheriff's office for 25 years, so obviously the immigration issue has, has changed dramatically. Uh, you know, we used to see seasonal workers that would come into the into the area and and they would work on farms, and and that was pretty standard fare. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, the folks that are in our in our community now are here uh, because they're paying off a debt to whoever got them here. Uh, oftentimes, they're living in squalor. They um, you know, they, they don't really have a life and they're, they're basically just trying to evade um, law enforcement efforts uh, so that they can, quote unquote, pay off that debt uh, and try to get to some life of freedom. Unfortunately, most of them really don't have that outcome. Um, you know, they're never going to see that outcome. And we oftentimes run into uh, illegals while we're investigating um many levels of crime, especially when it comes to uh, illegal narcotics. With our sure. board, go ahead, Susan. Well, I was just going to ask real quick, if you uh, happen to know uh, people that are paying off those debts and what those amount to and how long that might take them to do, because we, we've we heard if they're from Mexico, they're paying in the area of eight to $9,000 a person. And if they're from anywhere other than Mexico, they're paying anywhere from fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars a person. Yes, ma'am. So that that range that we've heard from different individuals uh, varies greatly. You know, we've heard as as low as five thousand uh, dollars that they're they're paying off to uh, amounts that seem um, unimaginable. You know, thirty thousand dollars plus, and and I would guess that a lot of that has to do with um, kind of who they who they joined up with, what other factors may have led to them uh, getting to the country or what mistakes they may have made prior. Uh, but to say that it's a, 
you know, that there's a good outcome for these folks is uh, it just it's, it doesn't exist. All right. Thank you. Sheriff, with our borders being um, as porous as they are, how would you feel about Weld County passing a resolution saying that it encourages cooperation with immigration officials to the fullest extent permitted by state and federal law and calling on the Biden administration to secure our borders to address the fentanyl crisis? Well, I'm all for uh, trying to figure out how to cooperate to the fullest extent with ICE and immigration uh, officials in Weld County and throughout the state of Colorado. The one caveat to that is that uh, my state legislators continue to put barriers up uh, that that don't allow uh, don't allow me or any other law enforcement entity to work with ICE. So our resolution would have to read differently. It would have to say that we fully cooperate with federal standards and urge the state to uh, to stop passing their their laws that that honestly hurt Colorado residents. Um, there's one that's being considered right now in the state of Colorado that wouldn't even allow a 287G program to operate. And for many of your watchers or listeners, they'll understand that that's a uh, contractual situation where you hold prisoners for ICE. Um, Colorado's working to try to ban even that practice. So uh, we have a lot of work to do in this state, but I'm fully supportive of working with ICE and, and doing the best we can to uh, uphold uh, what's left of our nation and, and fight back against the illegal immigration problem. Well, we definitely appreciate you fighting that. I know we're following a a potential detention ban with ICE bill that is uh, making its way through the Colorado legislature as well. So thank you, and uh, we appreciate your willingness to stand and fight for our country and for serving. Well, thank you for what you you both do. Um, Your organization means a lot to those of us in law enforcement, so thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. Thanks, Sheriff. I want to thank our audience for joining us today again, and also to thank Sheriff Reams and Susan Tully for joining Ferris Podcast.